Now, we're going to go into something else all together. Mark Smalley is a co-founder uh, and CEO of uh, Neuroware. It's a company that was initially founded by uh, 500 startups in Silicon Valley. And not only that, it's the first Malaysian startup, if I'm not mistaken, to go through the 500 Startups Accelerator program in Silicon Valley. Ladies and gents, please give him a round of applause as he comes up. Hello, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for staying on. It's been a long day. I've got a long presentation, um, so I'm going to try and go through it as quickly as possible. And it gets technical quite quickly. So I'm going to try and use a lot of pretty pictures if possible. First of all, though, I'd, I'd, I'd like to introduce quickly, briefly, to Neuroware before I get into the blockchain stuff. So um, I've been living out here in Malaysia for a long time now, 19 years. Uh, Ruben and I have been doing a lot of work in the community space, educating people in the region here. And as mentioned, we're early innovators. Uh, first Malaysian company accepted into 500 startups. But the most important thing there for me that really stands out is the work we did with DBS last year at the world's first bank-backed blockchain hackathon. Because it was during that event that we really got to talk to the developers and the banks about what they wanted. And since that event, we've been spending a lot of time in seclusion, hiding, building up our first product, our first enterprise product. It's the world's first blockchain-based operating system. But I can't really talk about that until we first talk about blockchains. And it's hard to get into blockchains until we start talking about digital money. And so this really technical product, you know, where does this story start? It starts here, on the island of Yap. Uh, this is their money, massive big stones, you know, trying to go shopping, trying to get your groceries was a group effort. It's really hard. So what did they do? They actually created the world's first public ledger. And this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about ledgers, and the story of blockchains is all about ledgers. So what these guys did is they put all their stones in a big field, and they said, if you want to make a transaction, you all have to come together, and it's a kind of a song and a dance, and there's a big party and people transfer money. And this was important because it wasn't the size of the coin that affected the value of it. It was the story. How did that massive coin get to the public ledger? And that's what was important on the island of Yap. Of course, that doesn't scale. And it's not going forward very well. So eventually, they switched to US dollars, as most people do, for now. <laughs> But when we think of US dollars, we think of real money. A lot of people do anyway. Um, so this is the world's sort of tangible assets that's going on in the world. US reserve, that's the coins and money, global real estate, gold. Everything seems kind of normal. This is trillions of dollars here we're talking about. And then Wall Street came along, and they kind of created their own centralized digital assets, and things got out of control quite quickly. It got even worse when derivatives came along. Um, for those of you that haven't already sort of got the derivative story, I'd strongly suggest going out and watching The Big Short. Big Short. It's now on Netflix as well, so there's really no excuse. But as you can see, compared to real money, gold, wow, things got crazy quickly. Where did this end? It ended in the 2008 bailout. So in the US alone, the 512 banks have closed down. That's not... 512 branches, that's 512 brands of banks. Um, more money was spent on the US bailout than every single world war combined. And that really frustrated a lot of people, myself included. And I'm not American, but you know, I, I thought it was too much. So the, 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 the point of this is that you know, nothing lasts forever. So we've got to get used to this thing. And you can tell this by going over and looking at history as a, as a whole. You know, the, average lifespan of a currency is only 27 years. The average lifespan of a world reserve is only 30 or 40. US wasn't always the world reserve, you know. The Brits were in charge at one point. And, you know, it's going to change again. And so the question becomes, especially from the banks, is, you know, what happens if you don't keep up? What happens if you fail to innovate? What happens if you fail to provide what people need? If you fail to provide it, someone else is going to provide it. And this happened in Zimbabwe, yeah, where the hyperinflation went up. In Zimbabwe, everyone knows about M-Pesa. It's SMS technology, right? And it grew really quickly. In 12 months' time, it had taken over. And, and here you can see, you know, this is the... In Zimbabwe, more people use the bus to transfer money from place to place than they do the bank. So banks are not always relevant. 
especially if they fail to innovate. And I don't know if you've heard this term before, software is eating the world. It's something I tell my children every day. And Mark Andreessen, a famous VC, was the one that coined this phrase. And, and I have to go over this line by line, but you've probably heard it before, the Uberization of things. Uber's the largest transportation company on the planet, but they own no cars. Airbnb, the largest accommodation provider, owns no property. Facebook, the largest content provider, owns no content. Alibaba owns no stock. There's a theme going on here. And that follows through with Bitcoin, where there are no coins, which we'll get into. So, you know, that's what brought us to here. And in order to understand blockchain technology, there's lots of blockchains. Right? The overall terminology nowadays is distributed ledger technology, which is why we started on the island of Yap. Blockchains are a subset of distributed ledger technology because they use blocks. So in order to kind of get to grips with this technology, a lot of what we're going to see now in this next section is just focusing in on Bitcoin. And this is the easiest way to understand, you know, what's that difference between Bitcoin, the digital currency, versus blockchains, the underlying technology that makes Bitcoin possible. So Bitcoin is really the first successful application that's been able to use blockchain technology. But I like to refer to blockchains as the track. And so long as you build a train that can fit on the track, you can go anywhere. So how does that compare to some of the other sort of distributed ledgers out there? There's Dogecoin and Ripple. So Dogecoin was kind of started as a joke, but you know, it's fast, it's cheap, it works. And because it runs on a track, it still works, you know? As opposed to Ripple, which is trying to kind of act like a blockchain, but it really isn't a blockchain. Um, so I won't cover much. Ethereum, on the other hand, again, this is a whole new kind of train. A lot of buzz going around Ethereum, which we'll get into soon. But it's a new kind of track. But so long as you have a train that works on this monorail, then you can function. So something, like to kind of give you an idea of what we do, I guess we have solutions that work on multiple tracks, but we don't provide the train. We just provide the thing that allows you to connect to the track. Versus a private chain, which doesn't do much at all. And so the biggest question a lot of people ask going back to the private chain is, you know, what's the difference between public chains and private chains? And it's really this simple. It's the amount of energy that goes into the network, the amount of energy that secures the network. And so what are the big benefits? Why is everyone in a fuss about blockchains? Everyone's talking about blockchains. It comes down to this, and it's really just the, two, the first two things here. For the first time in history, we have immutable, tamper-proof data. And it's hard to first grasp what that really means, especially if you're not technical. Because in the, at the moment, in the real world, everything's based on a database. It doesn't matter what it is. A website, application, everything on the planet runs on databases. And they usually run from a central service, or if you're really cool, from the cloud. But at the end of the day, you, they can be changed. They can be hacked. They can be lost. You can have a virus that accidentally removes all of the data in the, in the building. Immutable data through the blockchains, that doesn't happen. You know, once data goes into a blockchain, it can never be removed, it can never be lost, it can never be changed. And that's what immutability really means in this sense. And that's the thing that really got me excited. This, for the first time, we have this technology that allows us to do this and allows us to share information too. Again, in a traditional database, it's very hard to let other people come in and play with your data because you don't trust them, they might mess it up. Blockchains were designed to allow you to provide data that you can share with independent parties and the independent parties can verify. So here's some basic facts on Bitcoin. Uh, invented by a pseudonymous person or entity called Satoshi Nakamoto. No one really knows who or he, she or they are. And there's a few people that think that's a bad thing. That, you know, how can we trust something that we don't know who invented it? But I think it's a really good thing because it allows us to judge the technology. If we knew who created it, we'd be judging that technology based on their political views or their religious views. But because we don't, we, we've got no choice but to trust the code. And the code is trust on maths. You know, it, every language on the planet speaks the same math. So it's very easy to verify that this thing does what it's supposed to do. The facts and figures change on a daily basis, but what's really important is the technology that's behind it. Again, because it's a really complicated technology, right? Well, wrong. What's really interesting is that there's no new technology in blockchains. 
There's three pieces of technology, old technology, that's been brought together in a new way to do a new thing. You know, you've got hashes that were theorized in the 1800s but weren't made possible until we had mainframe computers. You've got the shards, which was invented by the US Navy. And then the most recent piece of technology is the peer-to-peer -peer part. And that was popularized by Napster. So it's this peer-to-peer -peer part that's enabled new things to happen, not just in the blockchain space, but in computing and security in, as a whole. So this is really important. It's the evolution of networks. It's the evolution of security. It's the evolution of business models. You could look at this in so many different ways. Right? You, we could think of the Ubers in the middle there, the Airbnbs, they're decentralized. So, of course, if you don't know, the problem with a centralized system, a centralized database, is you take out the middle node, and the entire network goes offline. So then some bright sparks, they invented the cloud. You know, this is 15, 10 years ago. It's only just getting popular now. And that sounds like a good idea, because you can spread out your data and things like that. But most of them are still run from a central authority. Or, more importantly, if you intercept a call between different subclusters, you can take down that subcluster. Distributed networks, however, were designed for nodes to come in and out of the network. So, so long as there's still two, net, two nodes functioning, the entire network still functions and can be picked up later. You add more nodes, it comes back up. And that's all that blockchains and Bitcoin really are. It's just a network of nodes. In the Bitcoin world, every node is equal. Everybody has a copy of everything. And that's how we can all be sure that no one can update or change in data independently, because you're going to have all the other nodes that disagree. And again, what's really interesting is, don't forget, there's no Bitcoin. Bitcoin itself doesn't exist. There isn't a Bitcoin coin. There's just a ledger, a ledger of who is supposed to own what. Because in the Bitcoin blockchain world, everything's based around keys, cryptographic keys. You know, every account is a key set. There's a public key and a private key. You can think of the public key as your sort of safety deposit box. We all know where it is. It's just that we can't get in and use the money unless we have the private key. But what's really interesting with blockchains is that it can get more technical than that, more than just a single key pair. You can have multi-signature accounts that require multiple people to put the keys in at the same time. You could also have it set up in such a way that you couldn't open the box until a certain time, or you could only open the box on a certain day, or you could only open the box when it reached a certain limit, or when it dropped to a certain limit. These are all things that you can program into a Bitcoin transaction, because Bitcoin is programmable money. And so what's actually inside a Bitcoin transaction? Well, it's a collection of inputs and a collection of outputs, and it gets technical quite quickly. But what's interesting is that the fees are not based on the value. The fees are based on the computational size, basically just the size of the transaction from a computational point of view. So it doesn't matter if you're sending $1 or a trillion dollars. It still costs five cents. You know, what's important is, did you, how many inputs did you have and how many outputs did you have? And so this is the best way to explain that inputs and outputs. It's a little bit like real money. If I had $10 and I wanted to give Alice or Bob five, I couldn't just rip the $10 in half and give her half of the 10. I have to give them the full 10 and hope that they give me the five back. Well, with blockchains, there's no hope. You don't have to hope that they give you the money back because you have to program it into the transaction. So Bob wants five. I have in my Bitcoin wallet here, I have 10, I have three, I have two. The first four is that, can't I just send the three and the two to Bob? That's five, that's good, because Bob wants five. No, because I haven't accounted for the mining fee, the network fee. Let's pretend I have to pay $1 for that. So we'll use this example better. I'm gonna send the 10 into my transaction. I'm gonna program four back to myself and send five to Bob, which means I've lost one. So in order to pay for a Bitcoin transaction from a programmatical point of view, you have to purposely miscalculate what needs to be done. Again, from a consumer point of view, this is all hidden. Alice sends Bob five, job done. But this is what's going on behind. And when we say an unlimited number of inputs and an unlimited number of outputs, this is what we mean. By that I mean, with one single Bitcoin transaction, we could take a dollar from every single account in Malaysia, let's say that we're all on Bitcoin, 
and we could use it to pay our taxes or pay donations or, again, every person in the country sending it to one person in one transaction. That would be possible. So then what happens? Where's the blocks? Okay, so the transactions are occurring all the time. Instantly they happen. But they don't get confirmed until they get put in a block. And the network rules state that, on average, every 10 minutes, somebody's going to add a new block to the end of the blockchain. And inside that block, there's going to be the transactions. And what's happening here is around the world, there's loads of these things called miners, which are another way of saying uh, transaction confirmers also, I guess. But miners are trying to solve these complex cryptographic puzzles. And the power that goes into this network, that goes into trying to solve these puzzles, is called hashing power. And as you can see, in 2013, the hashing power sort of shot up quite quickly. And this is what the network looked like at the time. This is what it was backed by. It was quite amateurish um, and could get crazy quite quickly. But in the grander scheme of things, 2013 was really nothing. 2013 is the red box. Uh, we're going up into real time there now. You know, mining is a billion dollar business. Um, this is a liquid nitrogen uh, mining farm. There's computers are submerged in liquid nitrogen and the liquid nitrogen is bubbling because the computers are doing so much computational power, this hashing power. This is one node in the network. So when we talk about, if you remember the sun, I was talking, what's the difference between public and private blockchains? A public blockchain, this is one node out of an average of six to 10,000 nodes that are securing the network. And that's why the network itself has never been hacked. So, yeah, obviously, Bitcoin isn't everything. It's just the start. Uh, what's going on in the blockchain space? Things are getting exciting now. This year has been a really exciting year. At least 65, more about 100 now. About 100 banks have publicly announced some form of blockchain investment or blockchain prototyping. But it didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of hard work that's gone in behind the scenes. Uh, William is a good investor, written a lot about blockchain space. We're here in the middle where? But it's this ecosystem that's taken nine years to build, which has now enabled the banks to get involved and the other players. You know, some of these are some of the people leading the way at the moment that have made public announcements on exactly what it is that they're doing. I always like to finish on IBM because IBM and Samsung, uh, about a year ago, they actually built a washing machine that was able to order and pay for its own detergent, which was delivered via drones from Amazon. This is a year ago, the, you know, we, we're doing this. Not, it's not the future, it's the, it's the past now. So some of the other big names that are playing around in the blockchain space, obviously the Australian Stock Exchange, Korea, Korean Securities, Hong Kong, Japan's been making lots of news, legalizing it, making it illegal, legalizing it again. So there's lots of blockchains out there, there's thousands of them, maybe tens of thousands. A lot of them are known as altcoins. Altcoins are basically because Bitcoin is an open source currency, right? Anyone can take Bitcoin and copy it and try to improve it. And a lot of people have copied Bitcoin, but not done much different with it, not made much of a, of a change. Some do stand out. We have people such as Dogecoin, Litecoin, Dash, doing some really interesting things in this space. What I would highly recommend is checking out CoinGecko. It's a Malaysian-based company. It's a little bit like the Bloomberg of cryptocurrency. They currently track the top 500 blockchains. That just gives you an idea of how many there are. But the biggest known name, the name you're going to hear the most other than Bitcoin is probably going to be Ethereum. These guys have been getting a lot of publicity, uh, a lot of players working with them. IBM, the washing machine I mentioned earlier, is powered by Ethereum. They've been able to raise a lot of money from the crowd because they're trying to take things one step further. And they've popularized this term that a lot of people are talking about now called smart contracts. But what is a smart contract? Really, it's... It's just a piece of code which is executed by the network. It sounds really simple, but this, this, is, this is revolutionary. There's, if you think about it, until this point, code is executed from a centralized server that nobody but the people that issued it can verify or check. You have no way of knowing whether 
what you're doing is, what you thought you was doing is, is happening. If your code is being executed by a distributed network and you can independently verify that it's doing what it should be doing, this changes everything. We've never had a technology like this. And so smart contracts are really everywhere. It's not just Ethereum. Even Bitcoin has smart contracts. They're hidden in a thing called the script. When you decode that, you start to get this language. It's a, it's a stacked programming language. It uses these op functions. There's about 100 different op functions, enough to do a lot of things, exciting things, the time-based things, and so on and so forth. But it's quite complicated. It's not easy to read, um, and it's kind of limiting. Where Ethereum tried to take things a little bit further is to not only make it more readable. I mean, this is based on it's a, it's a programming language called Salinity, which is based on JavaScript. So if you're a developer, it looks kind of friendly. And it also, it's extremely powerful. You can do almost anything in Ethereum. There's pros and cons to that, because the more complicated a system is, the more prone to problems it is. Something that I like about Bitcoin as a system is it just does one thing. It's just Bitcoin transactions. You just add on a new one. When you're not doing many complicated things, you can be sure that it's more secure. I've got a lot of slides to go through. Right. So Ethereum also offers a, something that's really the reason that Ethereum is so popular is one of their smart contracts allows you to create your own coins, your own custom tokens. And custom tokens can represent many different things. Now, if we fix the token supply to only ever be 100, and we change the dollar symbol to a percentage symbol, we now have equity. We now have a digital unit trust, because we know there'll never be more than 100. And so there's companies out there, this, this term DAO, is quite a popular term in, in our world, it's distributed autonomous organization. And in a distributed autonomous organization, you can even link the ownership of that distributed autonomous organization to be able to vote on the transactions that that organization then does. It gets really exciting and interesting. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so again, this is based on your understanding, uh, from a common commoner's point of view, what most people think of as banks is really check deposit, right? A lot of people just think the bank is there for you to put money in. And until, sort of until now, we had no choice. Banks were the only place that we could safely store money because we couldn't trust ourselves and we trusted banks. But the notion of what banks do and what banks will be doing in the future is most certainly definitely going to change. You know, they, these guys already have the KOI, KYC and AML in place. And to be honest, if I was trying to buy some Bitcoin, there's no one I'd much rather trust than a bank. I'd like to go to a bank to buy my Bitcoin. Because at the moment, it's more like buying drugs. You know, I have to find some stranger in a cafe somewhere, sit down and try and trade some money. Why? Why can't I go to a bank and buy it? If I went to a bank and buy it, bought it, the bank would then know everything I ever did. They'd be able to track everything I ever spent that money on. Crazy. And so this is, this is we know that this, this technology is able to, we know that technology and smart contracts are able to replace a lot of the common banking functionality. So banks could replace themselves with smart contracts or they could change into something different. When I started the presentation, I mentioned our work that we did with DBS last year. This actually won second place in the hackathon. It was using our technology, a hyperbank. It was hyperlocal banking for Filipino rural areas that was using the blockchains and SMS technology and multi-signature technology. Lots of interesting stuff. A few more players in the fintech space uh, that I like. Lawnmower is an interesting one. It's a little bit like Acorn, if you know of those. So what they do is you, you, know, you link up your account with these guys and you buy things. The change then gets invested into Bitcoin. And from there, it can get auto-invested auto into a collection of different speculative things, investments. We have completely distributed peer-to-peer -peer loans. And I've always found that funny, this notion of peer-to-peer micro-lending that doesn't use peer-to-peer -peer technology. I, I, don't, I don't understand how it's peer-to-peer. So there's remittance companies also that are using Bitcoin, and, and this is a remittance company that's using Bitcoin without saying that they're using Bitcoin, keeping everything in fiat terms. There's Bitcoin ATMs. 
There's even a company in the UK that's using the blockchains to track diamonds. These guys are getting a lot of publicity at the moment. But we started off, we were talking about these next big things, the evolution of business models and things. Like, we can almost be certain that the next Amazon, the next Facebook, or the next Alibaba is going to be distributed. Right? It's that next big business model. So we have some people working on this already. These are the market leaders at the moment from an Amazon point of view, distributed Amazon. We have a distributed Uber as well that's been around for quite some time. I think that's almost it. I now get to talk about myself for a little bit. But rather than talk about NeuroWare straight away, what I'd first like to do is make our public announcement on a new initiative that we've recently started. This is the first time I'll be publicly talking about the blockchain embassy of Asia. But it's formed by several Malaysian companies at the moment. And we're, it's, it's a community effort for us all to play with blockchains in a safe environment and learn about the legal and technical implications. Our long-term vision would be to become a DAO, the Distributed Autonomous Organization. Essentially, that just means a company running on blockchain technology rather than a company that has filing cabinets filled with paper. Um, so to summarize, the next IT revolution <laughs> uh, is blockchains, obviously. Bitcoin's future is somewhat uncertain, for sure. But the future of blockchains, it cannot be escaped now. It's that evolution of networks. And so, definitely, dis the distributed ledgers as well is one of the fastest growing technologies since the internet, and it's going to grow even faster. It's so quick. But something to worth remembering is that, like databases, there's no one blockchain for everything. There's different blockchains for different use cases. Again, I've really briefly covered blockchains today, and I only focused on Bitcoin. It's a very specific subset of the entire technology. And there isn't any one clear winner. Again, like databases, different blockchains for different use cases. So it's really important that if you are building on the blockchains that you try to build in an agnostic way, a way that allows you to switch between blockchains should you choose, rather than going all in on a single blockchain. And again, don't forget that whoever actually owns the private keys owns the money. If you don't have access to your private keys because you're using some online service that promises to hold your Bitcoin safely, it ain't safe, right? Blockchains and Bitcoins have never been hacked, but yet so many people I talk to say, oh, I just heard it got hacked the other day. No, that was some 16-year-old who decided to build his own bank and he's never built a secure application in his life, right? That's the thing that got hacked, not the actual protocol. So again, we always promote this agnostic development, and the way that we do that is through abstracting that at a protocol level. So we've spent nearly two years developing these free protocols, and that means that they don't really exist. A protocol is just a thing, it's like a set of rules. You do things in this way, something should happen. It's, there's not an actual tangible product there, but when we combine those, we get our enterprise product, our blockchain operating system. And what really powers it is Everstore, which is the world's first blockchain-based database. Uh, having the world's first blockchain-based database, we can actually build anything. You know, an operating system is just one of many things. And because it's using blockchains, and because it's in the browser, it's all module, HTML-based, very easy to customize through themes and plugins, like you would with a WordPress blog. And so where we've been spending a lot of time, last six to nine months, has been heavily involved with a lot of different fintech players. We're dealing with the ECF operators, trade finance, mortgages, peer-to-peer -peer operators. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And every single fintech player that we've spoken to has the same problems. There's one of two problems. There's, there's either a reliance on CS, like as a, from a technical point of view, so because nobody trusts each other, we're not allowed to use each other's databases. We don't have APIs. What we do instead is we send you a file every 24 hours with batch file stuff. So we, most people playing in the FinTech space have to deal with these batch files. On every 24 hours, they get a file and they have to update the stuff. Where this gets interesting, if we take the trade finance guys, for example, you know, they get sent a bunch of invoices. Their job is to then go and sell those invoices. But they're scared of sending it to multiple people because they have a shared file. So they, 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 they can only deal with one bank. They can only sell to one bank. Because if more than one bank sells that invoice within 24 hours, there's a reconciliation problem. So there's this real big issue of trust. Again, until 
blockchains came along, we really didn't have a choice but to trust some central service of some kind. Now we can trust maths. And so some of the people that have had some nice things to say about us, I'm pretty much done. Thanks. Questions, please? Any questions at all? Paul? Come on. Hold on. I think that works, yeah. Give it a go. Uh, so, um, so, you know the biggest DAO in Ethereum raised 150 million USDs mm -hmm. in, a, in a period of a month. A month, less than a month, yeah. Right. Weeks. What stops me from writing a DAO crowdfunded by completely anonymous investors to fund terrorism? What would stop or you from sending a suitcase of cash over to some terrorists? Yeah, but or a nugget of gold? But this is way more effective. I mean, I mean technology I will be used by everybody, yeah? I mean, when a new technology comes along, it will be exploited, it will be used in many different ways for good and evil. Well, crowdfund a robot army, something, I don't know. 